Live from Langley, BC, naturesfair.tv presents Lisa Kilgore. Now here's your host for the evening, Karen Markhart. So thank you everyone for your patience. On behalf of Nature's Fair Markets, I'm really pleased to have a very special guest here from the Okanagan. And of course, as you may or may not know, we are Nature's Fair, our chain of six stores, and we do have four in the Okanagan, one in Kamloops, and one here in Langley, as well as a mail order business at www.naturesfair.com. So if you're not familiar with us and just happen to see or hear about us um, from another friend, we're really, really glad to have you here with us. It's a special treat. We are live tonight on Nature's Fair TV, which is really exciting. We're so thankful to be able to bring this to you live in your homes and also to be able to watch at a future date. So that's really exciting. So now that we're all getting settled and everyone has their coffee, tea, organic goodies and has settled in, we have about an hour-long presentation this evening. It'll be between 45 minutes and an hour. And of course, the topic tonight is pain, inflammation and bone health which is so, so important for us to learn about because about 60 to 70% of us are in pain all the time, whether it is from joints or other issues in our bodies. And what we don't make the association is, is that it's caused a lot of times by what we eat. So what Lisa Kilgore does, she is a registered holistic nutritionist and she helps take big pieces of information and break them down into bite-sized pieces. She has her own website, which is eatmorerealfood.com. So it's a really, really neat website. She also has an e-letter that you can sign up for and get on that. So she sends you out a monthly, approximately monthly newsletter. <laughs> we always joke about that because it doesn't always happen bang on monthly. But that is life. Life is busy and we're stressed and we have so many responsibilities and choices these days that we don't necessarily pick the right foods or we forget what real food is. So it's very, very important to learn from a nutritionist, especially a holistic nutritionist. So without further ado, I'm very pleased to announce our speaker this evening, Lisa Kilgore. I'm on? Oh, maybe I'm going to change my mic. There, can you hear me now? Yep. Lovely. Oh, thank you so much, Karen. Um, Nature's Fairs are my favorite health food stores. Um, I love speaking um, at all the Nature's Fairs, and this is my first time here at Langley, so thank you so much for coming out. I'm so excited to be here. Um, I'm also talking about a subject that is really close to my heart. This is a very Passion, it's a strong passion of mine, um, the effects of inflammation in the body, but also in my practice, I really see how much it affects every moment of every day when you feel that pain, but also in your longevity. Uh, chronic inflammation can really create many chronic illnesses that, lower, that reduce our longevity. So it, this is really where preventative health comes in. Managing inflammation, knowing when it's happening in your body, and, and knowing just what, what comes out of it. What has caused that inflammation in the first place? Um, I have a couple rules for my talks, and I'm a stickler to all of them. The first one is if you have a question, ask it. Anytime. Please. I want to make sure that you walk out of here with exactly the information that you need and you want. So if, you, if we're talking about something and you have a question, please throw up your hand. You won't be the only one, but you might be the only one with the courage to ask that question. I'll also be leaving time at the end of the night to answer any question that you have, any question under the sun. So if you, do, if you have a question that's not quite related to what we're talking about, just hold it to the end and I'll make sure that it gets answered. The second one is a really important one. We're talking about pain and inflammation here. And as, as uh, Karen mentioned, 70% of us are dealing with chronic pain. So if you need to get up, walk around, move a little bit, because sitting for 45 minutes or an hour is excruciating, please do so. So the rule here is self-care, that you're taking care of yourself. Um, I, I just started working with an amazing group called Inspire Health. It's an integrative cancer care center. Um, it's based out of Vancouver, and they just opened an office in Kelowna. Inflammation is a big part of the program, but self-care is at its core. And I've really learned we all need to take care of ourselves, and this is a time to practice it. So if you need to get up, you need to move around, please, please do so. 
And the third really important one is I'm wearing heels right now and there's a lot of cords back here. So if I trip and fall and slip, we just laugh, okay? Because <laughs> it might happen. I also tend to spill water down my shirt. So that's going to happen at some point. It's just going to be a funny, we're not going to worry too much because that's why I only drink water. And I've stained way too many shirts. You have no idea how many white blouses of mine have tea stains all down them. Because while I'm talking, I talk with my hands when I spill everything. So are we okay with the rules that these are ones that we can abide by? Um, the newsletter that, that Karen mentioned, um, you can sign up for it if you're interested. It's at the back at the demo table with Heidi. Um, it does go out monthly-ish, which means it went out in September. I can't promise it's going out in October, but it will go out in November. So you won't hear from me more than 12 times a year. In that newsletter, I usually um, have an article about something that I'm that's in the news or something that's going around quite a lot. There's always a recipe, and then anytime I'm doing free public talks, I list those as well. I'll, um, I'm also joining with uh, Nature's Fair at the Vancouver Health Show, so we'll be talking about pain and inflammation again in Vancouver at the Vancouver Health Show in November, and so that will be in the newsletter. So pain, inflammation, and bone health seems like an odd combination. Pain, inflammation, bone health seem like separate body systems, and why are they together? I'm a holistic nutritionist, so the core of what I do is to take all of the symptoms that might be happening in your body and bring them down to what is it that's the, the causing all of these symptoms. Because I firmly believe that if a symptom is in your body, it's related to another symptom that's also in your body. That they can't be separate. That just because this symptom is in this body system, like it, uh, uh, heart disease, high cholesterol symptoms, and then you have another symptom like eczema, they have to be related because they're all in your body. And so what we're going to be talking about today is a core root system, uh, symptom that really affects many other symptoms around. We're going to focus our talk on how it relates to bone health, but really we're going to, I'll be talking about how it relates to all of these other different symptoms and how inflammation creates havoc in our body altogether. So we'll be going into what is inflammation. We're going to be going into chronic inflammation and how it is created in our body. We're going to be looking at what bone health is, how bone health and inflammation are related. And of course, we're going to end with a big talk about what to do. How do you get inflammation under control in your body? How do you know it's in your what's happening in your body? But what can you do today at home with your lifestyle and your dietary choices to help get un inflammation under control? Because right now, we all have the, have the ability, we just don't have the tools. So we're going to go through a lot of those tools. Chronic inflammation is a core. It is this really important symptom to be taken uh, uh, a look at. Right up here, and you don't have to be able to read all of them, but there's 30 diseases that Western mainstream medicine have connected to chronic inflammation. And that includes heart disease, cancer, diabetes, uh, nervous system issues, osteoporosis, uh, various metabolic syndromes. These are all related to chronic inflammation, and they're strongly connected. And so we want to really dissect what all of those connections really are. But really the key here is chronic low-grade inflammation, the silent kind. Frequently we feel it, frequently we're in pain, we feel it in our back and we feel it in our joints and we feel it in our hands. But for many of us, we have inflammation happening in our system. We have an, in, an immune system that's not balanced and this can create symptoms in, in a variety of places. Heart disease is a big guy. So chronic inflammation and heart disease are very connected. They're so connected that a test that your doctor does called the C-reactive protein, um, that test shows inflammation. And they relate the C-reactive protein test directly to your heart disease risk. It's, it's a, in a very, very important part. And this high, high rate of inflammation can damage your arteries, lead to arterial sclerosis, and really increase your risk of uh, heart attacks and strokes. Diabetes is a kicker. Diabetes is a big guy in inflammation. And, and, it's, and it's this really vicious circle. So what happens is chronic low-grade silent inflammation, sometimes silent, can damage the pancreas, 
leading to higher rates of insulin. And the higher rates of blood sugar and insulin damage the create inflammation, which damages the pancreas. So it just keeps going up and up and up and up and up. And this is why metabolic syndrome, where your blood sugar's high as well as your cholesterol is high and your blood pressure's high, those, that is a very strong and prevalent disease that's happening in our culture. And this, at its core, is inflammation. And it's tying all of these seemingly separate diseases together. And cancer. Cancer is... A scary one. Can cancer is one that we, we really fear. This is a diagnosis that many of us are, are afraid of or it causes a lot of stress when we have it. What's really interesting is the connection between inflammation and a tumor. What they're finding now is that inside a tumor, there are half of those cells, 50% of the cells in a tumor are, are immune cells and all of them are triggered towards inflammation. If, and that, that trigger towards inflammation is creating that tumor to grow. It's actually using this inflammatory reaction to grow. But if we can flip that switch away from inflammation and to more of a healing immune reaction, that, will, that can cause the tumor to shrink. So we can use our immune system to help heal our body. And they're finding, there are quite a few cancers now that, that they're finding if we just wait they actually can resolve themselves. Prostate's the big one right now. They're, they're actually leaving prostate cancer untreated to see if it progresses. And so we can use our body to heal it through these functions. But the big one we're talking about today is how it affects osteoporosis. And the reason I chose osteoporosis is because when, our, when we have a problem with our structure, when we aren't able to get in and out of bed, in and out of a chair, in and out of the bathtub, we lose our independence. We lose our ability to live at home. And so this is, and, and we usually don't pay attention to our bones until they're already weaker. And so this is why we're gonna be talking about this connection. Because if we really wanna look at the quality of your life, we wanna look at, at your bone health but we really are gonna be spending most of our time on the overall inflammation uh, picture. So, what is inflammation? We generally look at inflammation as a problem. So I first wanna dissect it as why it exists in our body first, because it's only a problem when it gets out of control. It's not a problem when it's doing its proper job. Inflammation is an immune response to heal damage. That's why it's there. Say I was doing what I always do and talk with my hands and I throw my arm up and I bang my wrist on, on a wall. I've done it before, it happens quite regularly. And, and I really cause a lot of damage in that wrist. But the first thing that's going to happen is swelling is going to uh, uh, encapsulate this wrist. And the reason of the swelling is that increased blood flow adds immune cells to that area and it adds clotting factors and it allows our body to heal. It's also going to hurt when I move my wrist. And the reason is, is so you don't move it. Your, your body's trying to heal here. So if you move your wrist, then you're gonna cause more damage. So that pain response is a, a necessary survival response. The problem, though, is when this inflammation gets out of control, when it's not healing damage, it's a reactionary, overwhelmed state. And this happens when, it, when our gut is off. This is very, very strongly connected to what's happening in our digestive system. In my practice, I work not exclusively, but primarily in digestion. Because if I was going to name one thing that relates to everything else, it's your digestive system. Because in the very, very basic terms, you are what you eat, absorb, and digest. You, every cell in your body is made of the food that you ate yesterday, the day before, last year, five years ago. You still have cells in your body that were made five years ago. And so what you eat affects how your body functions. But it's not just about what you put in your mouth, it's what happens in the digestive tract and how it gets absor absorbed and assimilated. And we don't pay much attention to this. Most of us have some digestive symptoms, 
Most of us have minor or major digestive symptoms, and some of us are dealing with very catastrophic digestive symptoms on a day-to-day -day basis. And these eventually, these, can sh these show an imbalance in the digestive system, but also create chronic conditions later. But in the immediate, they're not, not really taken seriously, which is my frustration. I have too many people dealing with 30 or 40 or 50 year old digestive issues that we with minor dietary changes get sorted out in a couple weeks. But uh, most of it's because it's not, it's not a place that we put any attention because it's not life threatening yet. Yes, chronic explosive diarrhea isn't pleasant, but it's manageable. But what it will do later is create uh, uh, cells that are weaker because you're not absorbing things. It's, it's going to create a body that's not in balance. So we want to look at our digestive symptoms for what they are. They're symptoms of indigestion. We're not digesting food properly. And we, can, we need to connect this into our gut because there's a very strong connection between what's happening here in our digestive system, our small and large intestine, and what's happening to our immune system and what's happening in our brain. We have as many neurons or brain cells or nervous system cells in our di digestive system around our small and large intestine as we have in our spine. There's, we have, this is a gut brain. We, we think of it when we have a gut reaction, we, we think of our intuition as being around our gut and there's a really good reason for it. There's a scientific basis to this. And they've also recently found that there's more of a conversation going from your gut into your brain than there's a, a conversation from your brain down to your gut. Think of that for a minute. We usually think of our brain going down and telling our body what to do, but this is the one instance where there's more information coming from our gut up to our brain than there is from our brain to our gut. And a lot of these message signals when they go awry come from an imbalance in our gut bacteria. Our gut bacteria is this lovely ecosystem that can be incredibly health, healthful for us or when it gets off can create a variety of problems. And it's huge. It weighs about, about the size of a brick, three to five pounds, but it actually involves nine times more cells than we have in our body. So you sitting here right now are 90% bacteria. Kind of get icky, isn't it? <laughs> and, and this inner ecosystem is a part of this gut-brain connection. And what they have found is certain strains of bacteria connected to depression, ADHD, autism, weight gain, variety of brain issues that you wouldn't expect to be around that would be caused from, your, from bacteria in your gut. They also communicate with your immune system. And 80% of your immune system is also based around your small and large intestine, 80%. And it's there for a survival mechanism. It's there because a lot of the viruses or bacteria or invaders that come into our system come in through our food, through our, through the, our mouth in general. And our digestive system is the first place it, it kills it. So if, if we had, say, um, a piece of peanut butter toast with um, the salmonella recall peanut butter, because that's happening right now, and we eat that salmonella peanut butter, that salmonella has to first go through a strong acid environment of our stomach, and that kills off most of the viruses. Then it goes into, if it makes it through that, it goes into our small intestine. And there's things called Peyer's patches. They're small immune organs all the way through your small intestine. And these let your, your immune system know if there's something coming to fight that they need to fight. And so if that salmonella gets absorbed into your bloodstream, your immune system is right there ready and ready to attack. And that is the proper function of our immune system. And that's why it's around our gut. The problem though comes when our digestive system isn't strong, when we have, when, when our digestive system is weakened for a variety of reasons, um, antibiotic use, um, overconsumption of sugars, former sugar addict here, I have a gut bacteria imbalance almost constantly, well I'm getting it under control but I know this, <laughs> I know what it feels like to be off. Um, from a variety of, of factors. And one of the biggest ones is because of the food we eat every day. 
And what happens when we eat the same foods over and over again, say we have wheat two or three times a day, we have dairy two or three times a day, corn, soy, these are big food allergens. If those are consumed regularly, we stop breaking down the carbs, fats, and proteins well. We lose the enzymes available to do that. We also digest poorly. We also eat in the car, and we eat running out the door, and we eat quickly and stressed, and we don't pay attention to eating. And so this puts another strain on our digestive system. And what this leads is undigested food particles in our small intestine. And the undigested carbohydrates is food for bad bacteria. Not good bacteria, bad bacteria. So undigested sugars from any forms of carbohydrates can feed this unhealthy environment. But when we're talking about your immune system, the story is in protein. When undigested protein gets into your small intestine and gets absorbed through your small intestine due to damage, and this damage can frequently come from that bad bacteria, that bad bacteria can secrete acid, and that will weaken your small intestinal wall and allow larger particles to go through. So instead of a single amino acid or a single protein molecule, now two can go through, or three or four, or larger chains. And when this happens, when you have a leaky gut or gut permeability, then these undigested protein can get into your bloodstream. And instead of going to your liver, like all digested food does, they go to your liver and your liver puts it back together. So um, amino acids get strung back together to make your hair and your muscles and your nails and all of the tissues that need protein. Your liver has nothing to do with undigested protein. It doesn't understand what it is. So it stays in the bloodstream but it looks exactly like a virus or a bacteria. And so your immune system fights it like it's a virus or a bacteria. So undigested milk protein looks just like or similar to the salmonella bacteria. And this re creates an immune reaction. So on the salmonella side, that was an important survival reaction. Now we have a reaction that doesn't really need to be there. It's not that dairy protein isn't harmful, but your immune system is acting like it is harmful. We see this reaction faster and more aggressively in, in true food allergies, like peanut shellfish. When somebody who ha that has this allergy consumes peanuts or shellfish, and within hours, they have a, a dramatic immune reaction where their throat closes, and they get hives, and it's life-threatening. Same properties are happening. Another common one right now is celiac disease, where somebody with celiac disease consumes gluten, the undigested gluten gets into the bloodstream, and now a different antibody, this one's IgA antibody, the first one was IgE, the IgA antibody triggers an immune reaction that da actually damages the small intestinal tract further. It's an autoimmune uh, style condition. But what most of us are dealing with aren't these big guys. These big guys get diagnosed, especially the anaphylactic shock. You usually know if you have an anaphylactic shock allergy. But many of us are dealing with a low-grade food sensitivity reaction. And this is the antibody IgG. And IgG is annoying. Instead of being fast and quick and you know what's happening, it takes like two, or two to five days before it happens. Do you remember what you had for lunch five days ago? It, this is why it's hard to figure out, because your reaction might be from a food you ate two days ago, or three days ago, or five days ago, and it makes it much more difficult for us to figure out what it is. But it's, not, it's usually not foods that we eat occasionally. It's usually foods we're having once or twice or three times a day. So that leads us to this chronic state of immune reaction. So our immune system, instead of getting this virus every once in a while, is getting this virus, this virus, I'm, I'm putting in quotation marks because it's really wheat protein or dairy protein or corn protein or soy protein, and it's getting it constantly. And this leads to an immune system that's overwhelmed because its to-do list is really long. Its to-do list always has this, I have to fight this virus and then I'll do everything else. And I named we, gluten, dairy, corn, and soy, only because those are the main guys. And it's because we eat them two or three or four times a day. Most of us can name the dairy and wheat or gluten that's in our diet. We, we see it. 
but corn and soy are insidious. They end up, they sneak into our diet, but wheat and dairy are sneaking into our diet as well. You might not realize you're having cornstarch, but if you have any processed foods, if you have crackers, if you have sauces in it from a can, there's corn right there every time. As well as corn sugars are ripe in, it's in spaghetti sauce and drinks and juices and it's, it's everywhere. Soy is even more insidious. We really don't know how much soy we're having. But if you eat any packaged or bagged food, chances are you're having some soy. And what I've seen in my practice is a wheat, each style of sensitivity has common, common symptoms. But because everybody's so different, it's really like, well, in general, when I see a wheat sensitivity, it presents this way, but it could present all of these as well. But what I've seen in chronic explosive diarrhea is a corn issue. Extreme exhaustion is a wheat issue. Weird inflammatory places where, it, where it's going in strange places is frequently a dairy issue. But this is just patterns I've seen over hundreds of clients of working through these types of food allergies. And everybody is quite unique and different. I have my own unique reaction, um, and it took me years to figure out what it was. Um, I have a sensitivity to dairy, and when my digestive system is break it isn't working at 100%, when it isn't digesting well, because I only react when undigested protein gets into my bloodstream. If I digest it well, I don't have this reaction. But what happens is, is I have dairy, and my stomach can be weak, and so it doesn't break down the protein very well, gets into my small intestine, and it, there might not be enough enzymes. And for me, dairy triggers an immune reaction. And the first thing it does is it hits my bladder, and it makes me feel like I have a urinary tract infection. Do you know how easy it is to go off dairy when you realize that that feeling can be removed immediately by taking dairy out? And for me, that happens within 12 hours. If my digestive system is really broken down and I also have um, a lot of stress in my life, then I'll get this spot of eczema on my finger. And that happens two days later. Frequently, on day three or four, I'll have some trouble breathing. Um, it'll hit my lungs. And these are symptoms that I have learned over the course of 10 years of realizing me and dairy don't get along and my body creating more and more symptoms at a higher and higher degree before I would listen and say, okay, I really can't eat dairy. It was the bladder thing that did it. The eczema thing, not so much. When, when it hit my bladder, dairy was out of my life. And happily. And, and our body will make a fuss. Our body will create symptoms that are stronger and stronger and stronger until we listen. And we want to listen when it's at this, the earliest symptom, so that way we don't have to deal with as many. But the, a lot of food-based allergies can really come out of, um, come out in really strange, strange symptoms. Yep, there's a question. So the, the, when we don't digest the proteins, it's because we have a sensitivity to certain foods, not just because we don't take the time to chew it properly? The, the, that's a great question. So the question was, if we have a reaction, is it because we have a sensitivity or is it because we didn't digest it well? Both. So I have, in my immune system, antibodies towards dairy. But I only trigger them if my digestion is poor. So if I don't chew very well, if I drink too many liquids with my meals, if my digestion is weak, then I'll trigger that reaction. I can't get rid of the antibody, but I can make sure my digestion is as strong as possible. And we're gonna talk about how to do that as well. But when we have these foods in our diet, when, when our foods are really high, or even just regularly uh, consuming these foods, once every five days is more than enough to have a constant reaction, then our immune system it becomes overwhelmed. And when it becomes overwhelmed, it starts making really poor decisions, to be honest, just like we do. When you get overwhelmed, do you think through things as well? No, probably not. When we, we, we tend to have poor reactions, and our immune system is exactly the same. It mirrors this. And so what happens when our immune system becomes overwhelmed is frequently a series of symptoms. And the first one is seasonal allergies. Seasonal allergies is always my first pointer towards an overwhelmed immune system and a possible gut imbalance. And the reason is, is that pollen, dust, mold, all of these things that are in the air, look very similar to a virus or a bacteria, but not exactly. 
So when your immune system is balanced, your immune system can tell the difference. When it's overwhelmed, it doesn't. So you might have noticed, that those of you who have allergies, that some years you have terrible allergies and some years your allergies are fine. And this is all about how the state of your digestive system. And if your allergies are progressing, we really want to look at the state of your digestive system. And sometimes it's small things, like you wake up with a runny nose every day, or you wake, wake up quite stuffy, or you have specific allergies to pollen and grass or ragweed. These are all manageable as well by, by making sure our digestive system is strong and that our diet doesn't include the foods we might trigger. So if I don't have any dairy through ragweed season, I don't react at all. But if I do have dairy, man, do I react <laughs> because my immune system is overwhelmed. <laughs> Eventually, new symptoms pop up. So this overwhelmed immune system is becoming more and more overwhelmed, and now it's sending actually out inflammation as a blanket through the body because it can't do its job well. It can't pay attention to all of the things on its to-do list. So instead, send this inflammation out everywhere. And so we might start feeling it in our hands, in our toes, in our knees, in our hips. And this is a sign that there's one more progression in this pain and inflammation. Last but not least are autoimmune conditions. Our immune system as a, a, a top job, so if we, are gonna, if we are going to write out a job description for your immune system, the very, very top job is a simple statement. Learn what, what parts should be in the body and where, what shouldn't be in the body and get rid of what shouldn't be there. So your immune system's job is to know your skin cell is supposed to be there but that virus isn't and to fight the virus but an overwhelmed immune system starts getting confused. And we see that in celiac disease. We see that in, in some forms of hypothyroidism, where the immune system is, is, is attacking the thyroid. We see this in rheumatoid arthritis, where the, where the immune system is now attacking the joints, frequently in the small ones. And this is problematic, but at any point through this, we can take control back. One of my clients, I saw her in my early days as a nutritionist. I, I feel very sorry for her because she got me right at the beginning. And she was my first severe autoimmune condition. And I did what you do in the textbooks. You, did go, you go through an elimination diet where we pulled out the big guys. We pulled out gluten and dairy and wheat and corn. And we, we needed to do this and she was totally fine to do this because her rheumatoid arthritis was so severe. Every morning, her husband picked her out of bed and put her in their chair. And for two hours, she slowly moved until she could stand. Two hours every day. Rheumatoid arthritis frequently hits workaholics, strong willed, driven people. And there's nothing worse as a strong willed, driven person to need to rely on somebody to just get you out of bed in the morning. But what we found was within a week of removing wheat from her diet, she could get out of bed herself. So there's never a moment where you can't help your body. And sometimes it's as small as that. But we need to sidetrack for a second. I want to talk about bones and then how they, how they connect because the bone structure is also a big issue when it comes to pain. So let's look at bones. If you don't mind, if we're going to sidetrack over here and then, we're, then for just a few minutes and then we're going to bring it all, all back. Because a lot of us don't think of our bones as living tissue. We think of them as just there. If I didn't have bones, I'd be a pile of jello on the floor, whoop -dee. Not a big deal. And it's not until we get those diagnoses of uh, osteopenia or osteoporosis do we really start looking at our bones. But our bones are, are remodeling every day. Our bones are changing on a daily basis. They just take a long time before you really see a difference. And our bones aren't just there for structure, they're actually there for two very, very important jobs. They're a bank account. They're a bank account for minerals. So the first job is for muscle, uh, and anytime your muscles move. So when our muscles contract, this uses calcium. Every time your muscles uh, relax, this uses magnesium. Calcium, magnesium every single time. Your heart's a muscle. And then the hierarchy of things your body needs to take care of, it always takes care of the life-threatening things first. So we store calcium and magnesium in our bones 
So we always can have our muscles to move. Our muscles will always move because we have this bank account, a very large bank account of calcium and magnesium in our bones. Calcium is always seen as the big guy, it's the most important part of, mineral, of, of your bones, and that couldn't be further from the truth. Um, unabsorbed calcium also relates to heart disease, and osteoporosis and heart disease always go hand in hand as well. All of the body systems are inter interrelated. So we want to make sure that, that our, the minerals are getting into our bones instead of just floating around through our bloodstream. The other job of our bones is, our P, is the pH balance. The acid alkaline diet has gotten a lot of, of press lately, and some for really good reasons. But there's this one really misnomer that is frequently in a lot of the um, articles about the acid alkaline balance that I just need to touch on before we get into it, because it's an important part of this. Frequently, they say in the acid alkaline diet that disease thrives when you have acidic blood, and that what you want is alkaline blood. You'd be dead if you had acidic blood. And this is one of the reasons why mainstream medicine will look at something like that and say, no, that's absolutely false, and because that statement is false. All of the other information around it, totally right on. That statement is false. The reason is, is our blood has to stay in a very narrow pH, 7.35 to 7.45. If it slightly goes out either side, you're dead. How your body keeps your blood at that narrow pH is the story to tell. This is the important part. So we take in foods that have various pHs. We breathe, we exhale, we move, we, we create uh, many different pHs we, by, by all of these systems. By the food that we eat, once it's used, leaves an ash that's a, that's a varying pHs. Whether or not we breathe well will either help our body become more alkaline or make our body more acid. Stress in general creates an acidic ash or it creates an acidic environment. So our body stores in our bones the minerals needed to rebalance that pH. So our blood stays from 7.35 to 7.45. And that's, these are life-threatening aspects of the body where you need to have muscles that move and we need to have a pH that's balanced and this is where our bones come in and they have found a significant connection between an alkaline diet or otherwise known as a diet high in minerals and strong bones. So, so we, we're seeing this also in the research that, that, that the diet plays a strong role and it's really a mineral thing. So in general what we're looking for is a, a, our lifestyle to put more, deposit more minerals into our bones than we are withdrawing. It's a bank account. We put more in, and we, a, 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 then we take out. And our bones have a really, really great amount of credit. We, we are born with an incredibly big bank account, and it takes a long time before we, we dim, diminish this bank account. It takes quite a ways to, uh, of not enough minerals, of not enough breathing, of all of these aspects before this bank account starts to get overdrawn. But chronic inflammation can speed up this process. And what you can see on this photo is what happens when um, inflammation is around the bone. So inflammation on its own, without any of the other inputs, increases the withdrawal of minerals in, around the, uh, it, from the bone. And actually what they have found in dissections of human beings is places of inflammation have a bone that's deteriorated. So it's not a whole body thing, it's actually in those spots. You see this in rheumatoid arthritis, this is an arthritic hand. But you'll see this in a tailbone, um, that, that ha with inflammation around the tailbone, you'll see it in the hip, you'll see it in the knee. And frequently, rheumatoid arthritis becomes osteoarthritis, where the actual joint is broken down. And this comes out of inflammation. So this is one of the main reasons why we want to keep our inflammation down so our structure stays good, so we can sit, so we can move, so we can get up and down, and so we can stay as independent as, po as possible. So what I really want to leave you with, and what I really want to focus the rest of our time on is how to reduce inflammation as naturally as possible. What can you do today? What, what can you do in your body 
that um, I just got the 45 minute warning, thank you. Um, what can you do to help reduce the inflammation in your body? Because this is a lot of this is under your control. A lot of this is stuff that you can do. And, and before we get into it, I want to stress that you don't have to do it all today, tomorrow. You can choose things one at a time. And every single thing that you try to do, you'll see a result from. And trying all, we're going over six points, trying all six at once will be overwhelming. You might feel great for like a week and then you'll go back to old habits and you'll have this memory of when you felt great. And that really is not worthwhile. What's more important is that you take steps forward as, at, at the speed you feel comfortable. And every step is positive. My diet went from entirely processed, entirely white flour, entirely white sugar, to the diet it is now, which is mostly whole foods, which works for my body, which keeps my body in balance, over the course of six years. My clients usually do it in about three months. Was that too slow? No. Do you know what would have happened if I had gone any faster? I would have this memory of when I felt great. I am the most stubborn client I've ever had, and I can say, without a question that my speed was perfect and your speed is perfect. So before we get into all the points, I don't want you to feel overwhelmed that you have to do everything. Choose what either is the hardest for you if you're excited to do it and try it out or what you feel comfortable doing because everyone is a step forward. And the first one is digestive health. I want you to pay attention to your digestive symptoms. I want you to actually see bloating, gas, acid reflux, diarrhea, constipation as symptoms to take care of. And we want to heal our intestinal tract as best as possible. And, and, and really keep your digestive habits as good as possible. We are a culture of the worst digestive habits around. We eat quickly, we drink tons of liquids with every meal, we are stressed, we run out the door as, soon, as quickly as we eat, we watch the news while eating, and all of this lowers our digestive function. So chew well, eat slowly, be relaxed, and you'll get more nutrients out of whatever you're eating. Be that a plate of fish and chips or a nice salad. You will get more nutrients out of any meal you eat slowly and comfortably in a nice relaxed environment than you'll eat in the car. And so, you can, so if your diet is beautiful and full of great stuff, but you're eating it quickly, you're not getting those nutrients. Second one is sleep. Sleep is a big problem in our, in our society. Most people have trouble sleeping. And when we don't sleep, we, our, our sugar cravings go higher, our blood sugar imbalances get bigger, and our pain increases. So we want to really pay attention to sleep and try something, just try stuff out. Uh, melatonin is a big guy. Uh, melatonin is actually an anti-cancer agent. Um, it, it's incredibly helpful to reduce incidence of, or reduce the um, incidence of cancer or reduce your likelihood for it. And it's simple. And for many people, 60 to 75% sleep beautifully on melatonin. But there are many people who don't, and so there are other options. But melatonin is always the place I start because the side effects are nil, and it's good for your body in general. But a big guy, big guy, let's go to sleep before 10. We're not going to do that tonight, but any other night. <laughs> um, our melatonin and human growth hormone all are secreted in that 10 to 12 p.m. time. So if you don't, if you're not asleep, you don't get it. And our adrenal glands kick out a bit of um, adrenaline at 10 p.m., around 10 p.m. And so we suddenly feel more awake and more vi vivacious, and we want to stay up even later. And this is a strain on our body. So as much as possible, go to sleep before 10 and really pay attention to sleep and solving any sleep issues that you might have. Possibly seeing a practitioner to help you with your sleep problem, trying a few things out. It's worth a try. Yep. What would happen if you were to work things? Sorry? What would happen? Well, I mean, is there any way of working around it at work nights? Mm. It's a really I mean, good question. It's 10 o'clock where your body says, okay, it's yes. 10 o'clock and that's it. So the question was, what do you do if you work nights? <sighs> it's a hard one. Because uh, honestly, a lot of chronic illness, the percentage goes higher when you, when you uh, do work nights. So if you are working nights, try to keep your night time as restful as possible. Don't eat a lot. Um, try to keep your stress level managed and then sleep as much as you can on the time off. It's not easy. 
And nurses especially really show the health effects of the night shifts. And if we could just get rid of them, it would be fantastic, but it's almost impossible. But really take care of yourself if you're working night shifts. This is a big one, really big one. If I was gonna name one thing that, that makes the biggest difference when it comes to pain, it is sugar. Sugar. So we have good sugars too. So when I'm talking about removing sugar, I'm, I'm talking about any refined sugar. White sugar, high fructose corn syrup, agave sugar syrup. Agave is highly refined, unfortunately. I'm sorry. It really, I'm sure there are some that aren't highly refined, but a good majority of them are very refined sugars. And when I see pain, I see loves of sugar, myself included. And when we remove the sugar, the pain goes down incredibly. My mother ha is having some really bad hip and, and knee problems right now. Um, and just about 10 days ago, she sent me an email and she said, I, I'm taking eight Tylenol a day. It's barely touching it. What can I do? I can't get into an MRI until November and I can't wait that long. I'm hurting. And so I gave her two suggestions. The first, we're gonna talk about the second one in a minute, but the first one was remove sugar. And five days later, she wrote me an email and said, in the last five days, I've used two Tylenol. So the eight a day wasn't touching it, and since then I've only had two, and made a dramatic difference. Another client of mine had, uh, came to see me because her energy was low, and she was popping candies all day because her energy was low, and she had a really busy day. She was a full-time student, mother of teenagers, busy, busy life, and working, I believe, too. And so she needed to pick her energy up. And I don't usually do this, I'm not usually this mean, but I cut sugar right out because I had to help her energy right away, and that sugar was draining her energy, not helping it. So she did this funny thing because of a symptom she didn't tell me about. She took her sugar bowl and put it on the top shelf in her kitchen. And the reason is that she hadn't raised her arms over her shoulder from here in, I think, five years. And so she put it in a place she can't reach it. Within a week, she could reach it. So she told me the story because she thought it was funny. I can now raise my arms over my head. I'm like, you didn't tell me you haven't raised your arms over your head in years? But this is the power of sugar. And so healthy sugars, good local, raw honey, beautiful sugar, maple syrup, gorgeous sugar. These have the nutrients your body needs to digest them properly. Don't overdo it, but moderate amounts, you can still have sweet things. And even stevia, it's a, a, a natural, no calorie sweetener, doesn't cause the metabolic problems that all of the artificial sweeteners do. So in those refined sugars, I'm also talking aspartame, sucralose, Splenda, all of those. So we wanna make sure that we're using natural sugars. But you don't have to go sugar free. That's a big one. I love sweet things. I have sweet every single day. I just don't have the Fruit Loops anymore. That makes a big difference. Honestly, like every day. <laughs> Fats are another really big key when it comes to balancing your inflammation. And you can use fats, anti-inflammatory fats, and reducing pro-inflammatory fats to balance out quite a lot of inflammation. I use this actually to balance out my asthma. My asthma is not life-threatening. I don't need to take inhalers, but it really bothers me. But if I bring in just the right amount of anti-inflammatory fats, my lungs are fine. And I'm a flautist, I, need, I play the flute, I need air. It's really important. So we wanna increase the anti-inflammatory fats. So the EPA-rich fish oil, which we'll, we'll talk about in, um, in the supplement part, we want to bring in extra virgin olive oil, a good quality extra virgin olive oil. This is just gold. This is just this beautiful stuff. And this actually slows, when you add fat to carbohydrates, you slow the release of that sugar into your bloodstream, balancing your blood sugar, reducing inflammation even more. Organic butter which I can't reach, it's over there. Can you pass? <laughs> organic butter is a surprisingly healthy fat. In organic butter, more so than in conventional butter, you get CLA, conjugated linoleic acid. And CLA has two beautiful properties. One, it's anti-cancer, and two, it reduces the fat around your waist. Yes, sorry? Fat around your waist. Yes, it has saturated fat in it, Yes, that can be inflammatory. We don't want everything to be anti-inflammatory. We need a balance. Your body needs to create inflammation when it needs to, but you need to have it balanced. So butter is a really nice balanced fat. So you still want to bring in the anti fully anti-inflammatory ones, but this is a really nice one. 
Uh, coconut oil, which I don't have up here, is a really good one. Avocado, nuts and seeds, and grass-fed, grass-finished meats, which you can get here at Nature's Fair. Grass-fed, grass-finished meats, make sure it's grass-finished, are also high in CLA, that lovely anti-cancer fat. The inflammatory oils are anything yellow, anything processed, and any fat that's in a form that it shouldn't be, like margarine. And I'm talking they sell healthy margarines. Any time a fat has been processed in any way, it damages that oil and creates a, 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 an inflammatory fat. So canola oil, sunflower safflower oil when it's yellow, all of those big guys, all of the conventional oils that can sit on the store shelves for, out, for years and years and years and have no scent and no color, those are inflammatory fats. Yes? That's a great question. So the question was flaxseed oil. Flaxseed oil, when done you perfectly, can be an anti-inflammatory fat. Um, but it's not stable. It doesn't have enough antioxidants to deal with digestion sometimes. So what I like is ground flaxseed. Flax oil, I don't usually use in my practice. Yep. Great seed oil, I'm kind of in this middle ground with it. Um, I like it because it, it works instead of vegetable oils, but it's still processed. Um, so I use it sparingly when I want a, an oil that has no flavor. What you generally want is an oil with a flavor because that shows a lack of process. That's a big one. So really look at the fats in your diet. Where can you pull out an inflammatory fat and put in an anti-inflammatory fat? And um, fish oils can be a really good way at creating a, a nice balance, and we'll talk about that in a moment. So the coconut, I'm sorry. Yep. Mm -hmm. Does it burn like, at like the same level as the olive oil? But that's a great question. The question was coconut oil, or yeah, coconuts. coconuts in general. They have really good fats in them. Um, yes, they're saturated fats, but they're very healthy it essential burn fats. At, uh, it it it, it burns. Yeah, it, it, you can actually take co coconut oil at a very high temperature, where you can't take for, um, olive oil. You can take butter and coconut oil, and you can cook them at much higher. Yes, you can. So, me, yep. Yes. All, all kind of olive oil. I know. So it's, uh, which one you can? That's a great question. So the question was, what kind of olive oil? The best, most medicinal oil is a beautiful, cold pressed, extra virgin olive oil. One that tastes like olives, smells like olives. You know, there's olives in it. Doesn't cook well. The green does not want to be cooked. Really low temperatures or keep it cold. Um, I will cook with the the less attractive, less healthy, regular olive oil. That's not, it is a partially processed oil, but handles heat a lot better. So these, in a dark bottle, um, it says cold press, and it, this one even talks about the flavor, because this is, if an oil has a flavor, it's, it's barely been processed. All oils need the flavor. So it's worth an investment in a really nice olive oil, and then use it cold on things so you get the flavor from it. Yep. What kind of oil could you use in cooking? In cooking butter, coconut butter, um, or the regular olive oil. Those are my main ones that I cook with. That was, what do we use with cooking? Ghee is wonderful. So ghee is um, simply clarified butter, so it's really just the oil. I have a s strong dairy sensitivity, but butter's fine, but if I'm taking a lot of it, I, take, I, I will clarify it and take the solids off, because that's where any of the, the carbohydrate or protein will be is in that. And what you get is just this glorious <coughs> fat, which is wonderful to cook with. You can also get ghee, I believe here, we have ghee, don't you? Yeah, there's ghee, you can buy ghee if you don't want to clarify it yourself. So we also want to add anti-inflammatory foods. And one of, a really strong, powerful thing to do if you're afraid to remove is to add. Simply add healthier foods. Ha add these anti-inflammatory foods instead of worrying about removing this or removing that. And so that can really help push unhealthier stuff out of the way. And so what you want to do is bring in some alkaline foods. And at the, I believe we have some pH pamphlets. And on them is a chart of the acid-alkaline balance. And it has a list of these are acid-forming foods and these are alkalizing foods. And what it's really nice is that it actually ha lists the most acidic food, medium and least, and then most alkaline, medium and least. So you can judge it. So if you're eating a very acidic food, you balance it with a very alkaline food. And it's just about balance. That's all it is. But alkaline foods are high in minerals. 
This is lovely black kale. If you haven't tried kale before, if you're afraid of kale, this is a great entry level. It's the weirdest looking of all of them, but the easiest to eat. So this is a really good one to have. Um, but all fruits and vegetables are al alkaline. Um, the darker the color, the more alkaline it is, but also the more anti antioxidants. Yep? Uh, when you cook it, is it um, losing uh, the alkaline properties? Great, that's a great question. When you cook it, does it lose alkaline properties? Um, only if you overboil it and don't drink the water, because it's in the mineral that you get the, uh, the alkaline property. You will lose some of the vitamins and the um, antioxidants in the air when you cook it. So do watch that. Yep. With, uh, with that, uh, uh, what what's it called? Uh, kettle. Yep. Yeah. We loved it. We make soup of that. Mm -hmm. It was very, very. Uh, in the end, that was an illusion. The doctor uh, oh, checked the blood. Right. Yeah. He told me you have uh, high potassium. High potassium, yeah. Sometimes, the question was he has high potassium, so he can't have as many vegetables. And that can be a body issue with balancing the potassium out. Um, that's a good time to talk to a nutritionist and get the, like, look at your whole diet as a whole and, and work on the balance of potassium. It is rare. Frequently, it's more of a vitamin K thing, which is the green color has vitamin K, and that's a coagulant. And that can t pull you off kale as well. But all vegetables, my favorites, um, there's a bunch of my favorites up here. Um, sweet potatoes and, um, oh, I love sweet potatoes. <laughs> They're my favorite. Um, but any of the vegetables, just eat more vegetables. But we also have spices. Um, some spices are the most potent, beautiful foods. And you can take a food that you're already eating, that you already enjoy, and add more flavor to it with spices. Things like ginger, garlic, onions. These are wonderful uh, anti-inflammatory foods. Turmeric is one of the most potent anti-inflammatories around. They actually rival a lot of anti-inflammatory drugs. And you can eat it. Just buy it and, eat, and, and add it to your food. Black pepper seems like this silly little condiment we always have on our table, but actually increases this, uh, the um, production of acid in our stomach and helps us digest protein better. If you like black pepper, chances are you need it. So add black pepper to your foods. And all of the spices like um, rosemary and um, oregano, all the fresh spices, those are the most potent greens you could possibly have. So add those to salads, add those to foods, grow them in your window. Um, when you have them growing, you use them a lot. Um, spices like rosemary in particular are high antioxidant and actually protect meat when you cook it. So when you marinate your meat in rosemary and garlic, they protect the, that meat in general. And last but not least, I know it's in there. I'm getting, I'm getting, there's, the, the, the side people are, are giving me uh, um, uh, suggestions. So there are some supplements that you can take, especially at the beginning of your journey or midway in your journey that can help speed up the process. The first one, and this product changed my life, honestly, is Greens Plus, uh, this is the Greens Plus O, but the, um, all, the whole Greens Plus line is fantastic for this. This is alkalizing. It has the antioxidant equivalent of six servings of veg vegetables. And when my diet was atrocious, it turned my brain back on so I could think and I could have energy and I could do stuff. Yep. Yes. Um, the question is, is it gluten free? All Greens Plus products, all Greens Plus are gluten free. Greens Plus O doesn't have wheatgrass and barley grass, which the regular Greens Plus does. Um, so, so it's, uh, it's extra specially gluten free, but they are all tested for being gluten free. The next one is um, fast joint care. This, I, this is the other thing I gave my mom. And within five days, she was feeling a lot better. This has the most spectacular anecdote stories of any product I've ever seen. Um, this is all a natural eggshell membrane, and within it's, it's proven to work in seven to ten days. And if it doesn't, you get your money back. But this works beautifully and quickly to reduce pain, especially in the joints. If you're allergic to eggs. If you're allergic to eggs, I would stay. But I wouldn't, I, there's other options. But if you're not allergic to eggs, it works beautifully. My favorite fish oil, by far, is O3 Mega Plus Joy. So when we were looking at fats, I had EPA-rich fish oil listed. This is an EPA-rich fish oil. And EPA is a part, a section of fish oil that reduces inflammation incredibly well. And this, two capsules of this fish oil has, the, the, the amounts of fish oil in it have been tested against rheumatoid arthritis drugs and been found to be more effective. The only side effect 
is the reason it's called joy. It helps with depression. Um, it helps your neurotransmitters move serotonin back and forth in your brain better. No side effects, but, and it works. It's unbelievable. It's always worth a try. Two capsules of this can do wonders for inflammation and just squash that inflammatory reaction. And last but not least is melatonin. This is sleep plus time release. What I like about this is that it's just, it's melatonin, but it's in a time release formula, which means it, it lets the, the melatonin out slowly all night. Because a lot of people don't have trouble falling asleep, they have trouble staying asleep. And that's what this really works well for. It also has the herb passion flower in it, which stops the brain spinnies. That's a technical term. <laughs> it stops your mind from spinning and, and calms your mind down so you can relax and, and fall asleep better. Again, it's just worth a try. If melatonin doesn't work for you, you know it within four or five nights, uh, but, it, but it doesn't hurt to try it. So, questions? We kind of went really far over, but uh, we'll take some questions. Yep. Valerian. Valerian. Valerian? Yes, a valerian is another um, herb that works beautifully for sleep. Um, and there's many different options. If you go to the vitamin section, the, the people there are well versed on all the different types of options. And there's one that works for everybody. Well, there's one that will work for you. And that's why there's so many. Um, because everybody is so different. Yep. So I heard that if you are saying that uh, uh, the products from like... Uh, like tofu and stuff like that. This is processed. But if it's natural, fresh, yeah. the, you are against those. Oh, the, the question was about soy, processed soy. I'm against processed soy. If you tolerate soy, fermented soy, like tempeh, miso, real soy sauce, not the full of wheat. See, soy sauce, the first ingredient is wheat. If you get the ones that are wheat free, yes, that's wonderful fresh. if you tolerate it. Fresh. The edamame, if you tolerate. So you're not against it? Not against it if you tolerate it. I, Processed soy, soy, yeah. Soy. Yep. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I drink coffee. Mm -hmm. Yes, coffee is lovely. It's a high antioxidant, black. Ha high yeah. black. But uh, somehow it's make like, uh, me gastritis. Oh, okay. So then whatever I do, mm -hmm. I cannot wake up. Uh, mm -hmm. I wake up uh, mm -hmm. in the morning, mm -hmm. but how yeah. to move myself? You're having your, t your energy yeah. is low. Okay. Yeah. Oh, so the question was, he used to have coffee, but because of digestive issues, can't anymore. Coffee, by the way, organic, fair trade, black coffee, beautiful. Add milk to it, add sugar to it, dessert. Um, to pick your energy up, there also there are um, some adaptogenic herbs. There's uh, green tea. There's, there are quite a few different things that can pick you up that, are diff that aren't as hard on the stomach as, as coffee. I would start with things like black or green tea, and then if that doesn't work, bringing in some uh, adrenal boosting herbs will, will, can help. I think there's a question right at the back first. Yep. Uh, first the red, red sweater and then the blue sweater. Great question. How do I feel about digestive enzymes? Fantastic. If the, um, but most digestive enzymes are pancreatic enzymes, and they only work if your digestive system is really top notch. What I use in my practice are plant-based enzymes. And plant-based enzymes work at a very wide pH. So they start working, and they work even if your, your stomach doesn't work very well and your small intestine doesn't work very well. And they can be a really great tool to help bring in the enzymes to let your pancreas rest. But only plant-based enzymes do that. Um, blue, blue sweater. And then are we done? Yeah. Is there um, the dairy products? Are there yeah. certain dairy products that are less reactive or more reactive? Yeah, that's or a great question. So it was with... Yes, with dairy products, are there ones that are more or less reactive? That really depends on the person, um, but organic, this is a great place to put up money in organic because the fat in the dairy holds a lot of hormones and antibiotics and residues from conventional farming. So I would highly recommend full fat dairy, but organic. Then bring it as natural as possible. So good quality yogurts that only have a few ingredients, um, raw milk cheese beautiful and easier to digest. The more processed it is, so if you have modified milk ingredients, the harder it's going to be to digest. So, so the more traditional, the better, and this is where to put money in organics. Can we have, do we have time for one more? OK, yes. I have five miles. Yes. Yeah. helps me. Yes. Could you explain more about mm -hmm. evening oil of primrose? That's great. Uh, the question was, she has fibromyalgia, 
and um, evening pr uh, primrose oil works beautifully for her. And the reason is, is that it's an omega-6 fat, which we tend to think of being inflammatory, but it's the form of omega-6 called GLA, and that is a really nice anti-inflammatory. And evening primrose oil can work beautifully for, for some fibromyalgia. Fibromyalgia is very unique to the person, just like sleep is, um, but it is especially good with eczema and psoriasis. That's great. And, and it, they're two different, both anti-inflammatory fats. So, so finding your blend is always a good idea. Is there any other Yes, it helps with eczema, psoriasis, it can help with um, hormones, it's really nice for skin in general. It's just a great, it's a great oil. And if you tolerate it well, go with it, that's great. So we're going to do uh, some draws. I'm going to be here to answer questions. Uh, we went, uh, my lecture went long, I'm sorry. Um, but I will be here to take, take your questions um, after we're, we're giving away the gift basket. BC's favorite nutritionist. Thanks, Lisa Kilgore. Thank you. <laughs> A real honor to have her here with us. She does a lot of work with us in the Okanagan, and we're going to be bringing her back here to Langley because she has so much valuable information to share. She'll also be speaking um, for us at the Vancouver Health Show. You can watch for that coming up in November. So that's kind of exciting. We'll be down there for Nature's Fair Markets. And Lisa is here this evening, so you can ask questions. We have the products that you'll be looking for. She talked about it on this end display. There's some at the middle tills, of course, in vitamins. Mona and Dolores can help you. Mm -hmm. Susie up here, this lovely lady with the draw box, is a testament to how well the fast joint care works. She took it after a severe knee injury. This stuff works in less than 10 days. So it's fabulous, and it's really gentle in system, works way faster than all of the other anti-inflammatories and joint care products. So, of course, um, somebody, I heard them mention energy. Greens Plus has yep. an extra energy product as yep. well, if yep. you're looking for that boost. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to go ahead and do the draws. I do hope everyone's in it, because we want to go ahead. We've decided to give out five different prizes. Oh, here comes somebody with a ballot. So we're going to get started on that. They're right in the middle. If you just quickly go put your name, I don't need phone number, address, or anything. We're just drawing it right now, so please do so and come up and see Susie here. What we might do while we're just waiting for those last few people to come up quickly, just a name, full name. We're gonna draw it right away. Don't need all the other information. Uh, Lisa will field a few more questions here. Okay, yes. Oh, that's a really good question. It was, what, do, what, what do I feel about the hype about eating for your blood type? It's, it's a lot of hype. Um, there is some truth in it. I have seen terrible vegetarians of O blood type. I've seen great vegetarians as an A blood type. But what I feel, personally, is that it's simply a place to start. I have never seen only four diets work for the majority of people. Um, but at least they, they have four separate ones, because there's no book that works for everybody either. So. Look at it as a place to start. How do you feel? Don't ever stay on any diet rationally. Um, I, I don't want you to ever be eating in a way that because it makes sense to you in your brain, but you don't feel very good. And a lot of diets, you can feel great for a while, but then your energy starts to fade or, or you start craving a lot of foods. And if that's happening, it's time to rethink things and tweak things. Um, I see this a lot in, in veganism right now, is, is uh, feel great for three or four months and then you, your energy starts to fade and the, and the cravings go skyrocket. This is time to rethink things, unless it's an ethical decision. Then it's time to find balance in it. But we, with everything, say this is a place to start. If it helps you feel great, fantastic, but always look at how it keeps you feeling good. Uh, the question at the very back, yep. So the, the question was um, hydro, hydrolonic acid and MSM. Um, they can work quite beautifully, but they usually take six to nine months before they actually start working, so compliance is an issue. It's not a problem. They do work well, and they're well tolerated in the body, but most aren't patient enough. That's all. Yep. I have a question. I have bone spurs in my Yes. Like, that's a great question. So uh, the bone spurs, which is inflammation in the heels, would arthritis relief or the fast joint care work? I teach fitness. I need yeah, I know. <laughs> I would actually, there would be something a bit more directly for you. So I would actually go with a fish oil and greens plus bone builder. Okay. 
Um, this will help you absorb nutrients better, absorb the bone building um, uh, minerals better into your bones so they're not spurring. And then the fish oil will, will, will reduce the inflammation. Yeah, like a high EPA rich fish oil. And, and if that's not working, then we need to, like it's, bone spurs are very direct and very specific. I think the joint care would probably work as well and it would be <coughs> worth a try, but I think yours is just a little bit more specific for you. Yep. Comment on calcium and osteoporosis. Yes, the question was, can I comment on calcium and osteoporosis? Yes. Taking calcium on its own can, has been related in studies to uh, increase risk of heart attacks to the extent that that shouldn't be recommended anymore. With bone and bone building, you want to make sure that you have no more than 500 milligrams of calcium at a time. You can put a six hour window between the two if you need more than one serving. You want to make sure you have magnesium, but you also want to make sure you have vitamin D and boron and zinc and lycopene. You need the full spectrum. If, you are, if bones are weak, that's where really good bone products come in. This was the original bone building product and the most studied. This Greens Plus Bone Builder was actually found to increase bone density as well as Fosamax. And this is, this is the only one that's been really well studied. Um, but also, you want to take in lots of minerals. And one of the best places that you can take in the whole complex is, is uh, chicken and, and bone stock. Where you, where you boil down the bone and then you drink it. And it's really, really absorbable. So I would bring in one, I would probably bring in both right away. Um, and, but if we're looking just food based, it would be in chicken sauce. Yes? When you have calcium supplements, how can you get them to your bones instead of adding to arthrosclerosis? That's a great question. How do you get your bone, how do you get the calcium to your bones? And that's by having a diet full of, vit of vitamin K and alkaline, well, alkaline minerals making sure that you're getting an absorbable form of calcium and making sure it has that whole bone matrix. So taking just calcium on its own won't do it, unfortunately. Yep. Uh, so the question was about sugar and in fruit. Can I eat too much sugar in the fruit? Yes, um, but if, it has, if it's a whole fruit, it's very difficult. So you want, I, I generally recommend, especially for lovers of sugar, to keep the fruit down to two to four a day. If you really are desperately in need of sugar, go for a piece of fruit every time. But when you have it in juice, that's too much fructose. It's, it, it, that can um, harm the liver and create um, weight gain, actually. So you want to watch the amount. Um, you do actually want to watch the amount. But usually two to four is fine in a day. Um, which one? Lady in the round. Sorry? The barley grass. Yes. Before it goes to sea, it doesn't have food. Exactly, which is why Greens Plus, though it has barley and wheatgrass, does not have gluten. But they removed it in the Greens Plus O because many people with celiac disease, understandably, won't even have that. But yes, thank you for the, for the clarification. Yes. Yep. Yes. Uh, the question is, is, is dairy product allergies, is yogurt and kefir also the same? Depends on the person and depends on if you absorb, if you digest it. The good bacteria in fermented dairy products actually breaks down the carbohydrate and the protein and pre-digests it for you. So for many people, they can still tolerate it. Others, no. You have to, you have to decide, you have to figure it out and there's ways to test it. <laughs> are, are we ready? Oh. Okay. Yes. Oh, juicing, like with carrots, spinach, yeah. and all that. Do you feel that that's too much sugar for a person's body at one time? That's a great question. Um, the question was about juicing all vegetables. Is that too much sugar? Well, there's actually a few other aspects. Um, juicing can really throw a pile of minerals into your system, but it doesn't have the fiber that you need. It doesn't, you're not chewing, and your, your, your body actually needs the chewing motion of your teeth to start your digestive system. And so you're surprising your stomach when all of this comes in. But if you are to juice and add some of the fiber back in, add a little bit of fat, because a lot of vegetable uh, vitamins um, need some fat, like vitamin K and beta carotene, they need a bit of fat. So you wanna add a bit of good quality olive oil. And then if you sit down and enjoy it like a meal, it can be great because, because it's pre-digested. But just gulping it right down, not always great. 
Okay, thank you. We're going to stop with the formal questions now. I'm going to turn Lisa's mic off. She's going to close up her equipment here. And we're going to do the draws. We were going to turn her off. <laughs>